Welcome to another edition of The Future Fast. And today we're talking to Irfan Khan, president of the SAP Platform and Technologies Division. He is presenting this week in the uh, SAP Tech Ed event, a session on realizing the data superpower. And that sounds like a fascinating theme for the 2020s, because among the many superpowers businesses will need, artificial intelligence and data analytics and the way you use your data is truly going to separate the superpowers from the basic functionality. So thanks for joining us, Irfan. To start with, tell us a little more about what you are talking about in terms of realizing the data superpower. Certainly, Arthur. And firstly, pleasure to be here today and, and thank you for hosting. Yeah, so when we refer to the data becoming a superpower, it, it really is talking about if we firstly look through the lens of COVID, where of course many, many customers and many businesses have been hugely disrupted. And whilst many customers may have been storing data, hoarding data even, and, and actually making sure that the data was, was managed precisely as it should be, right, with a high degree of competence, the data wasn't necessarily working for the customer. And in, in terms of what we're trying to advocate now with data becoming a superpower is really taking the foundation of all of the data processing, all the data management that is already being invested in, but really taking that value chain much, much higher up and actually the time to value to shorten that as well. And in the most part, what customers are, are really looking at right now is how can they make sure that their markets, their businesses are not being disrupted? They would like to disrupt rather than be disrupted. And at the same time, as we take a look at the very significant part of the processing aspect of data, there's also the very important part of actually looking at it from a predictive lens, also looking at it from making sure that they can take advantage of all the different constituents of data, right? Looking at it from structured, unstructured, all the way across, of course, in the new data sources as well. So in very quick terms and summary terms, Arthur, it's really about making sure that data can be used, not just in, in terms of the value equation of the past, but in the value equation of the future as well. And obviously, your business technology platform that you're talking about during TechEd uh, this week is a key element of, of it. Can you unpack that for us and tell us how that is going to turn data into a superpower? Sure. And in terms of the business technology platform, firstly, just to frame the BTP, and I'll use the acronym BTP because business technology platform is a little bit of a mouthful. So BTP ultimately is talking about a selection of different assets, right, across database and data management, across analytics, across process excellence, where you'd want to integrate and extend data, data and applications. So it's really a constituent of all those different environments and all those different segments. And it brings together a high degree of integration across all those different environments. Now, just take an example here where if you've got a customer today that is focusing perhaps on process excellence, just as you asked the opening question around data becoming a superpower, you need to have data excellence in, in combination with that. And this is where the BTP, through its ability to have trusted data access, the ability to make sure that you can look at data from a very significant integrity point of view, the BTP galvanizes all of the different assets across data and process excellence, and it makes it very, very easy for you to be able to take all the data, be it on premise or in the cloud, and being able to unify that data for greater value. So you see this as a layer on top of the uh, hyperscaler layer, the cloud data center uh, layer. Yeah, very good question. So the, the infrastructure providers, the hyperscalers, uh, as we refer to them as, have a very high degree of competence in terms of managing compute at scale and storage at scale. So therefore, it's, it's almost a given now that if we look at the three North American hyperscalers, that's, of course, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, and we take a look at, of course, in the Far East, Ali Cloud and, and Tencent and a few others, that will become almost the natural gravity of all of the different data and processing needs of our customers. So SAP took the BTP approach, which is we will sit on top of the infrastructure provider. So wherever you see the hyperscalers infrastructure, you will see SAP's BTP. And more importantly, this gives a locality of service and locality of data to wherever the data is being stored. And very simply, what it means is that SAP is not going to be wasting our time and our customers' time trying to cast out yet another infrastructure environment competing. There is no need to. They have a high degree of competence, as I've just said, and SAP will be gravitating towards them. All of this comprises terminology that when you started in the business 25 years ago, would all have sounded like um, a foreign language. No one would have understood what you're talking about. Can you give us a sense of the most significant or radical shifts that you have seen in technology for the enterprise 
over the quarter century of your career? That's a really great question. Um, you know, actually, if I, if I was to cast my, my memory back two and a half decades ago and, and what we were observing at the time, I mean, firstly, data in terms of big data, I mean, people would start getting sweat forming on their brow when data was over maybe even 20 gigs, right? And in that, that sort of time era, management of large data sets clearly was, was a challenge because it demanded so much curation of the environment, so much hand-holding, and so much capabilities were, were built up in many organizations where administration and, of course, skills around, if, if it's a database, it's DBA skills, if it's operations, it's operational skills. A lot of that was, of course, part and parcel of running large estates. And only the real few who had the high degree of competence and investment and budgets and people, the skills and people, could really compete in that market. So I would say that the biggest, most starkest reality of where we are today is just the management of data and the management of information at scale. And not just for the, for the select few who had high, degra, you know, high degrees of investment in IT, it's open to the masses. So I think just think if you were to kind of cast your memory back two and a half decades ago, we've gone from a, a level of excellence that only the few had, and now we have the masses being able to take advantage, and therefore it's created so much more business opportunity. I mean, all these new startups that are now, of course, household names, whether that's going to be, of course, Twitter, that needed a huge network, right, to be able to have interactions with a very significant community. Whether you think about eBay being able to have an e-commerce, you know, exchange, you think about Amazon, right, we're just starting off with the essence of a bookshop, an electronic bookshop, and creating the AWS environment to support that, now it gives every other business out there the same degree of, of capability. So I would just say what we're seeing is compute and store becoming mainstream, giving everybody the capability to run at scale and actually having a price point which is conducive to the market of, of great innovation and scope right now, which is where SAP is looking to take every one of our customers as well. That raises another uh, question which is right in the heart of your role at SAP, which is the marketing challenge around all of this uh, technology. How receptive are you finding uh, the market and how have you had to adapt your uh, marketing messages or your marketing strategy rather to try to persuade uh, your clients or the enterprise world in general to embrace uh, this new way of work? Yeah, so one, once again, thank you, Arthur, for the great question. So if you think about the, the modern workplace today, I mean, just look at what Salesforce has just elected to do is acquire a company called Slack, which gives them collaboration. So the modern workplace needs more collaboration. But equally so, I mean, we believe that one of the most fundamental things that most, if not all organizations will need is to have a high degree of competence in terms of having that process excellence, having that data excellence, and bringing all of these capabilities to market in much more of a suite-based approach. Uh, you know, if you want to call it a cloud native suite. And where SAP has been for the most part, if it's five, you know, plus five decades now, five decades, approaching five decades, I should say, is that it's had a very substantial foundation in data and, of course, processes, starting off from the on-premise world where we had, if not the best, certainly arguably the best that we've ever seen in the industry, the, the level of process integration of SAP across many, many industries. So that level of process integration and process excellence gave SAP the, the mantle of being really the best applications company in the world, the best enterprise applications company. So where we are today in marketing to the masses and making sure that SAP is relevant today as it was back in the day, is that you've got to compete now, not just with the best of suite, but also with the best of breed. So you're not just looking at the individual pieces. SAP's made more than 70 billion in terms of dollars worth of acquisitions of many SaaS companies in the last decade. You know, companies like Ariba, SuccessFactors, Qualtrics, et cetera, et cetera, and the list goes on. And why did SAP acquire these companies? Because there is an element of best of breed that was necessary. But now where SAP is at is actually galvanizing, integrating, and actually strengthening the sum of the parts to equal much, much more than the individual pieces. And this is why our working relationship with the hyperscalers, making sure that our suite, our business suite, our business technology platform is a very substantial underpinning of the, of the intelligent suite of the future, gives us a foundation of success. And we're seeing a high degree of adoption. We're seeing a high degree of interest through the partner ecosystem. And we're equally seeing a high degree of investment on our customers' part to make sure that they keep their SAPs common, particularly given the fact that the COVID lens, whether it's the disruption in the supply chain, whether it's the capabilities that they're looking for, is innovation in, the, in scope in the future. All of these things are really in the, in the belly wick of SAP. Moving on from enterprise challenges and solutions to societal uh, challenges. I had the good fortune two and a half years ago of attending Sapphire 
in Orlando, where one of the keynote speakers was South Africa's own Charlize uh, Theron. And she spoke about uh, what she was doing in terms of AIDS awareness and raising funds for um, AIDS activism in South Africa and spoke about how technology is being used to facilitate that. It was a great example of SAP's involvement in societal challenges. And I imagine so much more is possible just uh, two and a half years later, thanks to the new technologies that you're talking about at TechEd this week. Can you talk us through a little more about SAP's role in these societal challenges, for example, climate change? Sure, that's a great, great question. So if we think about where SAP has, has really focused its attention and its level of, of investment, I mean, sustainability is clearly, uh, you know, becoming a very substantial value add, not just a balance sheet uh, competence level, right, to show that you're, you're actually doing the right thing by, by the environment, but actually because most businesses want to be much more socially aware in terms of not just their environment, but of course of social well-being as well. And where SAP is really dedicating its attentions are that we talk about, for instance, the ethical supply chain. We talk about the foundation of most customers wanting to know in that supply chain, where the information, what are the assets that are being used within their supply chain. So SAP is putting a lot of investment in terms of tracking and tracing, using blockchain as a mechanism of looking at reliability and persistence in that supply chain. Taking a look at the different types of services that you need to have to extend and integrate with. Just as you, you take a look at a lot of these, uh, in, in, in most, most governments today, right, whether you take a look at the elections of the US, whether you're looking at elections in, in the in developing world, people want to know that, the, that things are taking place in a fair and open and fashion way. And this is one of the areas where SAP is continuing to invest, right? Where we take a look at our foundations in technology, whether that's the BTP being used to extend many existing applications. And of course, when you look at the most significant problems that we're dealing with today, I mean, only this week, in fact, SAP has, has been working with the likes of Moderna, okay, right? In terms of helping them in the distribution of the vaccine, which will be going out to millions and millions of people across the world. So we're looking at really taking our core value, our benefits that we've developed over the last four decades and making sure that we can give every single customer out there a step up so that they can take advantage of all the opportunities that exist in front of them. So it's really about SAP helping one on the, on the sustainability level of every business and then at the individual level of every entrepreneur that's out there as well, helping them also innovate and be as much of a value to change to the way that they've, you know, they'd like to operate in the future as well. Thanks uh, for that answer. I'd like to move into the future now and ask you to look into your crystal ball and tell me what you see as the most transformative technologies of the coming decade and specifically where you see uh, businesses leveraging those technologies and what benefits it'll bring those businesses. Yes, I mean, only a matter of months ago, we were bringing in the new, new decade, uh, 2020. And if I cast my memory back, I mean, just some of the big bets that were being placed around maybe connectivity with 5G networks becoming so much more pervasive, giving 100x performance improvement over traditional 4G networks. We take a look at the OEM vendors out there, right? The original equipment manufacturers, where they wanted to put a lot more predictive into the individual uh, capabilities, whether it's a product or service. Because of the, the reality is that everything is so distributed today. If it's a refrigeration device, whether it's an appliance in your home or in a, in a manufacturing plant, the reality is that you need a lot more autonomy, the ability to, for that environment to be managed almost with a high degree of predictive value rather than a service technician having to go along and do a service call. Also, if we take a look at the, the foundation of revenue operations, right, where you look at margin leakage and revenue leakage, you know, tying, tying together operations and revenue so that you have a single straight line thought process between when a product is conceived and the profitability that you would want to get out of that. All of these pieces really are big, large assertions or big investments that were made at the beginning of the century. So if we build upon some of those things now and we go fast forward the next decade out, I would assume that because of 5G, we're going to see the pervasiveness of enterprise applications, not just the, the kind of the classical applications which were just you know, hosted and stored on, on premise world, really making enterprise grade applications where you know, highly distributed applications, geographically distributed locations could be connected with a high degree of resilience and integrity across all processes. Whether it's going to be a hire to retire, that's the most fundamental on-prem, all the way through to courses, very substantial processes that will be created in the future. 
Now, as we also look at the next decade, one of the ultimate things that we'll be seeing is machine learning and artificial intelligence get talked about in a very theoretical sense. And with SAP's Intelligent Suite, the business technology platform allows a rendering of every single application, every single process integra integration or access to actually take advantage of those capabilities. So we're going to see in the next decade, you know, the UX, for example, the user experience changing tremendously. Conversational AI will allow us to be able to use not just chatbots in a kind of benign way where you kind of interact with them on, on, a, on a per incident basis, they become much more pervasive. So in summary, I'd say that there's been a lot of innovation scope at the beginning of the decade. And as we start building upon some of those capabilities in the next decade ahead, it will be like the cloud computing wave that took place in the last decade. Everything will become mainstream and a lot more capabilities around AI, machine learning, blockchain, etc. as a technology foundations, just like in BTP, will make themselves available to the masses. Everything will be fast. Thank you very much, Erfan. Thank you for your time and uh, good luck with TechEd 2020. Thank you very much and a pleasure talking to you today.